Hey, 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 everyone. Welcome back to another episode of The Daily Show, where we talk about interesting facts, trivias, and other fun stuff, I guess, with side commentaries, you know, uh, along the way <laughs> for everyone's daily knowledge. Um, again, welcome back. Uh, this episode is for December 7, and uh, we have a lot of things to talk about. For example, uh, daily observances. We'll talk about cotton candy. Are you guys a fan of cotton candy? I used to. Um, what about you guys? Um, when was the last time I ate cotton candy? It's been a long time, actually. Um, I haven't been to in any fair either, especially the Orange County Fair, you know. Uh, so I'm kind of missing cotton candy. Uh, we're going to talk about trick shots, too. And just to, you know, kind of make it more specific, we'll talk about uh, basketball trick shots. Yeah, I mean, because there are, there are other trick shots in other sports, you know. And then we're going to talk about letter writing. Um, maybe something that a lot of people haven't done for a very long time now, considering that uh we have this new um well i mean our modern technology um also affects the way we communicate now you know instead of writing letters we're typing um uh, typing uh documents and, and letters actually so i mean because it's it looks more neat it looks more presentable and it's prone to less mistakes because if you misspelled something all you have to do is press backspace so. um for today in history it's december 7 so we're gonna be talking about the bombing of the pearl harbor i mean december 7 is pearl harbor day if everyone if anyone of you guys remember um and then we'll travel to belgium and learn some of its national symbols as usual for for tuesday um uh what do you call this for, for tuesday episode and as usual stay tuned for our stuff of the day like i said the only thing that changed so far because we're not in winter time yet now we're not officially at winter time so i'm not changing the wallpaper i'm, I'm going by season yeah it's not by month <laughs> so um anyways the only thing that changed would be the uh christmas trivia because we're done with thanksgiving and then the uh musical artist and then of course the word because we're in december 12 letter word all right, let's get this show on the road as just like what they say, right? All right, so we got Cotton Candy Day. Look at that. I mean, this girl is really enjoying cotton candy. What's amazing about cotton candy for me is like it looks big, but if you take a bite of it or if it gets wet, it it, it shrinks because it's made of sugar, basically. And uh, you just kind of uh, sp spin it, you know, uh, into like a, like a cotton, like a silk silky kind of uh appearance and texture and it, it fluffs is that the term is that a good term it fluffs it, it becomes fluffy <laughs> there you go but if you take a bite in it it literally melts right uh before your tongue that's it you know um oh and from the reminder make sure you just if, if you want to take a bite of this um awesome treat well you know moderation you don't want a lot of sugar uh, that's not going to be good for your body. Um, aside from the this awesome confection, you know, we're going to talk about the history. Um, but first things first. Um, if you know any places uh, that has or that sells cotton candy, let me know in the comment section below. I'll give you a clue. One would be fair. I just said it uh, at the intro a while ago, you know, especially Orange County Fair here in Southern California. Um, they do have cotton candies, you know. Um, I'll, I'll leave the rest of, of the answers to you guys as far as where you can buy or like what are the common places where you can find cotton candy. You know? I'll give you another clue. <laughs> it's in the background right there. So, yeah. Anyways, uh, there is some indication that cotton candy originated from spun sugar in Europe uh, in the 19th century as far as history is concerned. Uh, but the story and creation of the machine spun cotton candy as we know it goes back to a handful of people at the turn of the 20th century uh, and you'll be surprised that some of those people were ironically <laughs> dentists yeah i mean uh i guess as a comparison you know if you're a doctor the last thing you wanted to 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 have uh, your your, or the last thing you want for your patients to have would be uh, 
you know, something that will affect their health. As a doctor, you would want your patients to be healthy, to remain healthy, right? I would say, shouldn't that go the same, you know, pretty much the same for dentists? Like, as a dentist, the last thing you would want your patients to have would be some problems with their teeth, their dental health, right? Um, but yeah, it's kind of ironic. Like, you're, uh, a dentist would invent something that is too sweet for someone's taste. But in 1897, confectioner John C. Wharton and dentist William Morrison invented the electric spinning cotton candy machine, uh, which they filed a patent for. So at the 1904 uh, World's Fair, the Louisiana Purchase Exposition in St. Louis, um, they introduced their confection as Fairy Floss. So it's, it's, it's not called cotton candy before. Actually, I prefer that name, Fairy Floss. <laughs> It's like you're, you're flossing your teeth with sugar. Oh, you know what? Yeah, that's not a good name. No, <laughs> that's not a good name. Fairy Floss. Uh, they sold more than 68,000 boxes of their treat at 25 cents a box at that time. Again, we're talking 1904. Um, for a total of more than $17,000. Uh, similarly, Thomas Patton, or Thomas Patton, also experimented in heating sugar to create cotton candy. His creation debuted at the Ringling Brothers and Barnum and Bailey Circus around 1900. Um, <clears throat> some sources conflate that the uh, patent story with the uh, Wharton and Morrison story, and some also claim it was Patton's machine that was used at the World's Fair. Um, after it was tweaked by the Electric Candy uh, Machine Company, whatever the case, it is clear that cotton candy debuted somewhere around the turn of the 20th century. So, as far as the source or who exactly invented it, it's uh, it's kind of blurry, you know. But everyone can agree that it's somewhere at the turn of the 20th century. These when these um, awesome confections were invented. So, although the cotton candy had been created, it did not yet have the name cotton candy. Another dentist who was involved, we're talking about, uh, his name is Joseph Lasco. Um, he built a machine and sold uh, the treat to patients in his Louisiana office. Okay, that's, I don't know. I, I don't know about you guys, but that's not sounding any good. <laughs> you know, because like I said, you're a dentist and you'll be uh, promoting something that could risk a person's uh, dental health or hygiene, you know. But again, I guess it has it. It all comes down to moderation. So if you're doing it in, in moderation, if you're eating cotton candy in moderation, so I don't think it's gonna be a problem, right? Um, it is believed that he is the one that changed the name to cotton candy in 1921. In 1949, Gold Medal Products created an improved cotton candy machine that had a spring base. Um, and most cotton candy machines are still made by this company today. Cotton candy machines are operated by putting a sugar called floss sugar, which I guess came from the initial name Fairy Floss, right? Um, into a small spinning bowl, which heats up. As it spins and heats, uh, it gets pulled out of the larger outer bowl by centrifugal force. Um, where it solidifies in the air and it's caught by the sticking or, or the cone, you know, the stick or the cone. Um, it kind of doesn't show, right, wait, am I, where, where am I facing? <laughs> I guess I'm facing the other way in my camera. But yeah, it's 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 kind of hard to show, but, uh, or it's kind of hard to see in the picture, but there should be a stick there. I mean, you guys have tried cotton candy before. You should have an idea that you have uh, some sort of handle and the rest will be uh, covered by the cotton candy, right? Um, so, and then, uh, although cotton candy consists almost entirely of sugar, it is now most times flavored and colored, with two of the most popular varieties being blue raspberry and pink vanilla. Uh, th those are like the main flavors. Um, I was gonna say, speaking of sugar, right, because it, w it, it, it wasn't, uh, it's not gonna be as good, especially if you're eating, consuming a lot of sugar. Um, from what I know, there are some specialized cotton candies now. When I say specialized, you know, there are sugar-free can uh, uh, cotton candy. There you go, sugar-free cotton candy. Um, I'm not sure though where you can find one, but 
I just want to tell you guys it's out there already. So hopefully it becomes more common, especially for those who have to limit their uh, sugar intake, but at the same time wanted to enjoy uh, cotton candy, you know, the taste of cotton candy. So that's something you guys can look forward to. I mean, it's it's starting to become more more and more common for the sugar sugar free cotton candy to be around. So yeah, there you go. So do you like cotton candy? Let me know comment section below. The next up is World Trick Shot. I forgot the word day, <laughs> but I mean we by by the time you're watching this episode or this daily show, you probably would have seen a lot of uh, the episodes now. So they pretty much end in the word day because it's, a, it's an observance, sometimes week, you know. Um, but for my episodes, I'm focusing on just like single day, pretty much. So world trick shot day. So what is a trick shot? Well, a trick shot, it's it's right here. I mean, from the name itself, it's a shot that seemingly or unlikely or impossible shot, right? Or, or something that's kind of possible to do. Um, or a shot, a type of shot that requires someone with great skill to make. Yeah. Um, world trick shot day was created by the Harlem Globetrotters. That's why I have these pictures. They may not be the original Globetrotters anymore, but they're still going. <laughs> uh, um, I forgot what I was gonna what I was gonna say. Uh, recruiting. There you go. Recruiting new members and uh, honing their skills to perfect these trick shots. Right. Um, I, I'm not really big on basketball but i did play basketball and uh you know from 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 the time i've been playing basketball i i learned that it's it takes practice to become good and uh, what they're doing uh they're not they don't really play uh you know the globe trotters i'm talking about them they don't really play on like competition you know if ever they're making what they're doing is performing they're performing um some exhibition or trick shots if you may um, that's why uh, th that's what the Globetrotters was were known for for their trick shots, their exhibitions. So um, <clears throat> this encouraged and allowed fans around the world to demonstrate what they can do with this, with some imagination, creativity, a basketball, and a hoop. You know, so you only need four things. Well, aside from yourself, you need a hoop, you need a, a ball, a basketball, right? And then your imagination, creativity. Let's see how. Uh, how much you can fancy a trick shot. Um, the Harlem Globetrotters, founded by Abe uh, Sapper's team, um, played their first basketball game and made their first shot in 1926 um, and have been making waves in the world of sports and entertainment ever since. Um, like I said, they may be playing against someone, but their focus is uh, more of a like exhibition, not, not an actual uh, professional uh, competition you know not like nba so but it's still awesome to see them because like a lot of those shots are kind of impossible to do in in my opinion you know it, well at least for me it's, it will be possible for me to do not unless i actually spend time practicing honing that skill um, they gain popularity with their antiques and amazing abilities in the basketball court today they hold numerous world records for their feats and continue to push the limits of the game um, they also invite and engage fans all over the world by encouraging them to make trick shots or trick shot videos and share them. And since we're in the uh, technological age where information is easily shared, you know, you got like a lot of social medias here and there, then yeah, uh, a lot of people definitely are sharing their trick shots all over the world. Um, popular Globetrotter Hammer Harrison is reported to have said, and I quote, we practice them because it's such a thrill for us and our fans. Our fans give us great feedback when we post them. We love getting the chance to see what they can do too. That's, that's this is a pretty awesome group, if uh, if you may, because they're actually reciprocating on on the response or on the reaction of their fans. You know, like they do have followers, but at the same time, they they are actively entertaining their followers and encourage them to that that they whatever they can do or whatever they're doing the fam can also do so that, that's pretty good it's positive encouragement right there that's awesome um the globetrotters are proud inductees of the naismith memorial basketball hall of fame 
and have entertained hundreds of millions of fans, including presidents, popes, kings, queens, over nine thrilling decades. Wow. Oh, again, nine decades. That's a long time. And, you know, members come and go. That's the thing. Um, but the group is still there. They're still around up until now. All these make all these make today a remarkable one to show that we humans have no limits to what we can do. Like a lot of people are saying, right? Um, especially inspiring people. They said the the only limit is your imagination. So you you break the barrier in your imagination. You just uh, kind of uh, go past whatever. Uh, how do you say? Well, whatever uh, uh, doubt you have to yourself, and hey, you know it's gonna. Your possibilities are endless. So yeah, pretty awesome. I may have to try a trick shot or two, and uh, I don't know if I'm lucky enough. I'll show. I'll, I'll show it to you guys. I think the most famous trick shots that a lot of people are doing are like the backward shot. You know, I mean, it, it looks plain and simple, but it's it's obviously hard to do because first, you're not seeing the the hoop. I mean, it's hard enough for you to. Uh, have a good shot while looking at the hoop, right? Well, I mean, what more if you're doing it backwards or not looking or looking away from the hoop? So that's the most common thing that I know. Um, what other trick shots that I, I would... I, I'm, I'm just naming some of the easiest ones to do. And when I say easy, I'm not saying it's easy for everyone. Uh, it's, it still takes practice. Like a half-court shot, I would consider that as a, uh, a trick shot. Right, because you don't usually do a half court shot. I don't know if someone did a full court shot, but yeah, there you go. And then, um, I'm sure there are different tricks with their specific names, but like I said, I'm not really familiar with them. So there you go. If you know someone, maybe a family member or a friend, or or a famous uh, basketball player aside from the Globe Trotters, uh, let me know uh, in the comment section below who. Uh, is that awesome person that you wanted to share that that is awesome in doing trick shots all right and our third observance for today we got a letter writing day there you go so the revival of the tradition and the art of handwritten letter writing is the basis of this day and I think it's a good it's a good observance to remind us I, even though you know it's very convenient to do your whatever letter you want um, through keyboard you know uh, through typing through the keyboard makes it more neat and ever um, if ever I mean writing using your own hand to write letters uh, should still be a skill that uh, a lot of people a lot of kids should learn you know letters have been written since antiquity like they were written in ancient India Egypt uh, Sumeria um, and during the time of ancient Greece Rome China we're talking about like ancient age you know uh, writing has been there ever since and it's gonna be a bummer if if we stop practicing how to handwrite you know throughout the history they have been written on various materials such as uh, papyrus um, animal skin pottery um, even in walls found out mistaken you know but have long since been written on paper the mass production of paper and advances in transportation led to an ascendancy in letter writing so family and friends were able to stay connected more easily over long distances um, and in some instances letter writing became an art form which is true you know like some people would would pursue writing as a form of art you know um i gotta be honest my handwriting is not top notch but i still know how to write yes i still know how to write um i remember last well not last time but when i was when i was in elementary actually when i was in grade school um we are required to uh well obviously we're required to do uh to to handwrite but i guess what i'm trying to say is the challenge where uh the teacher our teacher will give will give us um like a plain paper with no lines you know uh you know what i'm talking about like a, it's just plain paper like a copy paper for example and you're gonna try to write uh 
and you got to make sure that your your writing is aligned it's not slant it's not going down or going up and that's that was a challenge because you don't have the guides you don't have the 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 lines that would guide you so you won't go up and go down so it's it's a matter of uh, precision at first you're going to be really slow doing it um but later on if you started getting used to it you'll be able to actually uh, write in a plain paper a copy paper with no guides and but it's, it will still look even it would it would still look aligned there you go well i don't think i can do that anymore <laughs> i mean i've been exposed to type typewriters i've been exposed to keyboard and computers for a very long time but the thing is I, I i still know how to handwrite so yeah for today it's a good practice if you're having some difficulty uh writing uh you can you can start practicing you know you can start practicing yeah it, it does say letter writing day but you can focus on the writing part you know um if you wanted to if you wanted to uh practice your your fine motor skills that would be good oh by the way i have a surprise for you guys i have another observance uh we got the fourth one right here international civil aviation day now Civil aviation is a non-military aviation. It, it could be both private and commercial. Um, this day is a day that recognizes the importance of air travel to the social and economic development of the world. Well, I mean, yes, we do have military aviation, but uh, we also have the private and commercial. I mean, just like when you want to travel from one state to another, then yeah, it's civil aviation right there. The day exists to raise and reinforce awareness about this importance and about the role of the International Civil Aviation Organization, or ICAO, has been facilitating a global aviation network to benefit everyone. Um, for example, in the United States, there is a Federal Aviation Administration, or FAA, the Civil Aviation Authority, and each country regulates aviation licensing, overseas flight operations, issues certificates of airworthiness for aircraft, um, overseas aircraft maintenance organizations, um, designs and constructs aerodromes, and manages air traffic services. Now, uh, I don't want you guys getting overwhelmed with all the things that I said, but basically, you know, to make it uh, sound more simple, uh, for, for, for the uh, organization for ab about flying or aviation, and they are divided into more specific terms, you know, more, more specific branch from maintenance to safety to, uh, uh, I guess, giving certificates to, to the pilots if they're, if they're, uh, qualified enough to fly a plane, you know, like those, those different subcategories of, the aviation organization um, so for today um, maybe you guys can do a little bit of sharing for me when was the last time that you flew or uh, when was the last time that you have been on a plane I'm gonna tell you mine nine years ago I think I think it was nine years ago that was the time when I uh, uh, went went to Vegas but instead of driving I mean yes uh, that's the only state that i've been or outside of california i haven't even been to san francisco you know but maybe one of these days maybe one of these days um but yeah instead of uh driving that will take you four hours or more de depending on the traffic you just fly from i would say lax oh i did fly from lax to las vegas and it only took us four to five minutes a little bit less than that i think but yeah, there you go. So, I mean, it's very convenient, right? So for today, we also celebrate this, um, the uh, non-military aviation experience. So it's like your commercial travel plane and stuff. So um, let me know in the comment section below, when was the last time that you flew or you've been in an airplane? Or are you even com comfortable being in an airplane? I, I know some people would be not so comfortable, uh, especially if they see how high they are from you know from from the sky or from the from the ground i mean <laughs> so yeah there you go Th those are our um observances uh, this one the last one i just put other notable observance but yeah you can you can celebrate it Alrighty, um today in history we'll talk about uh, like i said a little bit sad but it's part of the uh united states history and we have to talk about it um 
because we don't want to forget um, the event that happened and, and the people that we lost at that time um, during during the, the bombing of the Pearl Harbor. So, you know, what happened 7.55 a.m. Hawaii time, a Japanese dive bomber bearing the red symbol of the rising sun of Japan on its wings appears out of the clouds above the island of Oahu. Uh, the swarm of 360 Japanese warplanes followed, uh, descending on the U.S. naval base at Pearl Harbor in a ferocious assault. Uh, the surprise, uh, surprise attack struck a critical blow against the U.S. Pacific Fleet and drew the United States uh, irrevocably into the World War II. Um, and then with the di diplomatic negotiations with Japan breaking down, President Franklin D. Roosevelt and his advisors knew that an imminent Japanese attack was probable, but nothing had been done to increase the security at the important naval base at Pearl Harbor. Uh, <clears throat> much of the Pacific fleet was rendered useless. Five to eight battleships, uh, three destroyers, and seven other ships were sunk and severely damaged, and more than 200 aircraft were dis destroyed, you know. Um, another sad part of this piece of history was a total of uh, 2,400 Americans uh, perished and 1,200 were wounded, many while valiantly attempting to repulse the attack. Uh, Japan's losses were some 30 planes, 5 major submarines, and fewer than 100 men. Um, fortunately for the United States, all three Pacific Fleet carriers were out at the sea on training maneuvers. Um, these giant aircraft carriers would have uh, would have their revenge against Japan six months later at the Battle of the Mid of Midway, reversing the tide against the previously invincible uh, Japanese Navy in this spectacular victory. Um, again, it's a sad part of uh, this country, uh, the U.S. Uh, history. Um, but we all know what happened, you know, um, the end of World War II, the Japanese Empire or the Japanese government surrendered. Um, we have another one. Uh, this one is a little bit upbeat, <laughs> I would say. In 1787, actually, this uh, going back in time, uh, Delaware becomes the first state to ratify the Constitution right there. So... Um, if you are joining our Zoom session and uh, you see the question, which state became the first state, you should know the answer by if you see this episode right here. <laughs> In Dover, Delaware, the U.S. Constitution is unanimously ratified by all 30 delegates to the Delaware Constitutional Convention, uh, making Delaware the first state of the modern United States, USA. Yeah. Um, less than four months before, the Constitution was signed by 37 of the original 55 delegates to the Constitutional Convention meeting in Philadelphia. The Constitution was sent to the states of rat for ratification and by the terms of the document, the Constitution would become binding once nine of the former 13 colonies had ratified um, the document. Delaware led the process. And on June 21, 1788, New Hampshire became the ninth state to ratify um, the Constitution, making federal democracy uh, the law of the land. Government under the U.S. Constitution took effect on March of 1789. So there were, uh, I mean, I guess we did talk about the fast forward uh, of the time, but Delaware was the first um, state or the, well, the first state to become the state. I mean, uh, the nickname of Delaware was which, you know, it's, it's first state. That's one of the nicknames. Now, I did mention that New Hampshire became the ninth state to ratify the Constitution. So, I'll give you guys a wonderful challenge. Can you name the, <laughs> the state? And you don't have to say in order, I guess. I'll, I'll be more lenient. But states uh, that became the second all the way to the eighth, um, again, if you can name them in order according to their statehood, that's awesome. If not, you can just name their, you know, the, the other eight states or, well, it's not eight anymore. Um, seven, actually. The other seven states um, after uh, Delaware and before New Hampshire. Leave it in the comment section below. 
All right, we're doing notable figures born today. Let's go ahead and start with Mr. Bench, John Bench. Um, 1947, uh, he was born in Oklahoma City. Um, he played LMB, or did I say LMB? I meant MLB. There you go. For 16 years with the Cincinnati Reds. A 14-time All-Star selection and a two-time National League MVP. Wow. He was a key member to the Big Red Machine, and which won six division titles, four National League pennants, and two World Series championships. Um, he is widely considered to be the best catcher in MLB history. That's that's pretty awesome. Um, every time I, I, I watch baseball, which is not a lot, by the way, I kind of like I tend to focus on the batter, you know. Um, but you know, being a catcher also plays a major role. I mean. You know, you could you could you could turn the tides around uh, if you could catch the ball um, pretty good. So yeah. All right, next we have another sports figure, Larry Bird. He was born in West Baden, um, is that Baden? I'm not sure or Baden, Indiana. Um, he's an American Basketball Hall of Famer. Um, his position was forward. Um, he's also a coach, executive. From Boston Celtics, three-time NBA champion, 12-time NBA All-Star. Again, a lot of achievements right there. Awesome achievements. Um, he is the only person in NBA history to be named the most valuable player, coach of the year, and executive of the year. Wow, there you go. I mean, he has it all. <laughs> he has it all. There you go. All right, we're going to be uh, doing the place of the week now. And we'll talk about Belgium. Um, we're going to be talking about national symbols. Um, the first one's Belgian lion. Now, the Belgian lion is also part of their crest, you know, their emblem. And, all, and also, a lot the lion, to be more specific, Belgian lion, is their national animal. And I'm pretty sure we mentioned lion here in, in our daily shows, uh, daily show episodes. You know, a lot of daily show episodes, actually. If not and not as an animal of the day all it will be part of the uh, national symbol national animal so um pretty sure you already know a lot about lions uh if but if not uh, just you know some key things that 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 i want you guys to remember lions is kind of like the exception uh, to the big cat family where the other the rest of the big cat fa family are solidary meaning they just wanted to go solo right uh not for lions they actually um group up and they don't really e even though they're called king of the jungles they, they they're not really living in the jungle they're they're living in the kind of like grasslands and stuff like that all right um the next one oh i guess they didn't move there you go um, national flower of Belgium. It's the red poppy. Now the red poppy is commonly known as just poppy, uh, corn poppy, corn rose, um, field poppy. Oh, or you can just yeah, you can definitely just call it poppy. <laughs> um, very few flowers have played such a significant role in let's say religion, politics, and medicine as the poppy. Um, these bright red flowers have often enchanted poets and helped doctors for centuries for a very long time. Uh, in the northern hemisphere, it generally flowers in late spring. Uh, but if the weather is warm enough, other flowers frequently appear at the beginning of fall. Um, it grows up to about 28 inches in height. The flowers are large and showy, about uh, 2 to 4 inches across. Uh, the poppies have four petals that are stunningly red, and they usually have a black spot at their base. Uh, the flower stem is usually covered uh, with coarse hairs and... Um, or that are held at right angles to the surface. And for a traditional game in Belgium, um, we have crossage. Now, I'm not, I, I wanted to apologize because I'm not sure if that's the right way to pronounce it, but I'm kind of like just pronouncing it in an American English way, crossage right there. Um, this sport is uh, reputedly an ancient ancestor of the modern sport of... Can you guys guess? It's not hockey, alright? <laughs> Even though the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the stick is kind of thick right there. It's actually golf. It's actually golf. Um, this 
is a team sport in which one team will try to hit a wooden ball uh, toward a series of goals, trying to get there in a given number of strokes. However, the thing is, unlike in golf, you don't have your ball uh, all to yourself. The opposing team can use their turn to try to knock your ball away from the goal. Um, this opposing action on the, on the part of the opposite side makes the game one of strategy as well as skill. I mean, don't all the sports, right? They, they require strategy and skill. So those are our um, national symbols and traditional games or activities in Belgium. All right, and that's pretty much everything we have for Belgium, their national symbols and a uh, traditional activity or game um, for Belgium. Again, moving on to stuff of the day we're gonna run through it we're gonna be starting off with the animal of the day disney version and we're gonna talk about hey hey <laughs> do you guys remember him i don't know if you've seen the uh, animated disney's animated uh, feature film um if you haven't i hope i'm not spoiling anything to you it's uh, from the film or animated feature film moana right there so hey hey um, he is a bumbling, accident-prone rooster and the village, quote-unquote, village idiot of Motonui. Um, when Moana embarks on a journey, if you guys remember the movie, um, Heihei unintentionally stowaways in her canoe and joins the adventure. Yeah, he accidentally joined uh, Moana. <laughs> so, But um, Heihei is actually based on a breed of... Uh, rooster or chicken called the bantam rooster or bantam chicken you know so what is a bantam chicken i mean what's the difference between a, a bantam breed i guess uh versus a, a wild chicken or or a regular chicken uh well a bantam chicken is a miniature version of the regular chicken um they can vary from one half to two thirds of size of the regular birds um, the origin of the word Bantam is from the seaport of Bantan, Indonesia. Um, so they may be small, but they are bursting with personality and happiness. I mean, come on, just 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 imagine Hey Hey, right? He's he's bursting with personality and happiness, and a little bit of uh, silliness, I would add. Um, anyways, although each chicken has its own individual personality, Bantams are known to be mostly calm, placid, and friendly birds. Just like hey hey, right? Minus the silliness, I guess. Uh, as such, they're ideal pets for those who'd like to interact with their chicken. Um, of course, they won't naturally want to be your best friend, so you'll need to spend some time handling and fuzzing them over or fuzzing over them before you really see their good temperaments shine. Um, if you guys remember, uh, we did showcase a video, not on the Daily Show, but on Zoom, uh, from uh, one of my amazing animals. Um, session you know where we talked about the life cycle of a chicken and uh, I showed a video of you guys uh, I mean to you guys I, I showed a video to you guys about the uh, uh, someone hatching a chicken um, through a what do you call that incubator there you go and uh, <clears throat> if you guys remember um, that youtuber uh actually formed a bond to the chicken they call they call the chicken rambo right and uh we followed rambo's story and uh yes i mean uh it, it was wonderful it was wonderful so you can that, that that could be a good example rambo the chicken becoming uh a pet in, instead of uh something you will serve on your dinner table so yeah um, as far as their diet is concerned, it's, I mean, they're chicken, so they would share the, uh, the similar diet for uh, the regular chicken too. Alrighty, we got a fall version, plan of the day, because we're still at fall. Um, we have the dogwood. Um, they may be famous for spring buds, but you won't want to miss the splendor of the dogwood in fall. Uh, among the first trees to show fall color, its leaves turn scarlet as red berries appear. Oh! Excuse me, that was my phone. Uh, it, its leaves turn scarlet as red berries appear. Um, birds will flock to a dog, dogwood's fruit, making this tree a favorite among bird watchers. There we go. Um, next would be 
our musical artist you know what i haven't shown our artist if uh, i guess next time i would showcase uh what he looks like you know instead of the album cover it's just you know i got used to putting the album cover instead um but to be fair some of the album covers in uh, in the previews uh artists that we showcase in the show uh they have their faces on the uh, on their you know on their album um except for jose marichan um but we do have another music that we'll talk about a wish on christmas night still in the same album which is christmas in our hearts and like i said uh if you have time especially christmas season is coming give it a shot and let me know uh if you like the song or you love it uh, let me know if you like it or you love it right so again uh for our musical artist of the day it's Jose marichan he's a filipino singer um and he's really well known um as as a singer who's making christmas themed music you know? i mean he does have other albums he does have non-christmas songs but he's really famous for for his christmas song renditions or originals there you go all right for our 12 letter word is that 12 letter let me count one two three four five six seven eight nine ten eleven twelve yes i've confirmed um that this word is a 12 letter word and it is dactyloscopy <laughs> i'm smiling because i'm i kind of doubted myself if i pronounce that right let me say it again dactyloscopy there we go all right now it is a noun but let me spell it for you dac it's d-a-c till that's t-y-l osk or os o-s and then copy uh, c or copy you know c-o-p-y now if i spell it straight it will be d-a-c t-y-l o-s-c O P Y dactyloscopy it is a noun again and it means a method of studying fingerprints you know to establish identification yes um, we should know by now that fingerprints are very unique to us granted there are some similar fingerprints but it's it's very rare right it's very rare uh to the point that we could still use our own fingerprint as an actual uh identity right there so yeah we got that dactyloscopy and the last part of our sh uh, show today uh, christmas trivia uh, did you guys know that the tradition of hanging stockings comes from a legend about marriage not christmas but marriage <laughs> so have you ever wondered why we hang up stockings uh, which are basically fancy socks um, during the holiday season only to wake up on Christmas morning to find them filled with tiny gifts? Well, according to the Smithsonian, um, one of the most popular legends about the tradition's origin or origins is the tale of a poor widower who worried that he wouldn't be able to marry off his three daughters because of his uh, lack of wealth. Um, fortunately, Smithsonian's explained, or explains, Saint Nicholas was wandering through the town where the man lived and heard villagers discussing the family's plight. Um, he wanted to help, but knew the man would refuse any kind of charity directly. So instead, you know, one night he slid down the chimney of the family's house and filled the girl's recently laundered stockings, uh, which happened to be drying by the fire uh, with gold coins. And when he and then he disappeared. And in the morning, the family found the gifts, and the daughters were became eligible to wed. Twas the <laughs> Christmas miracle, and I, I just wanted to emphasize that it was just kind of like a legend or the story behind it, you know. Um, so that's where the uh, tradition of hanging stockings came from. Um, I I honestly didn't know that up until now. So <laughs> there you go. It wasn't purely about Christmas, even though Saint Nicholas has something to do with it. You know, Santa Claus has something to do with it. Um, I did not know Santa Claus was okay with giving money. <laughs> I, I, I should I, I should have just asked him for money when I was young, you know. But no, I've been asking for toys and stuff. But 
okay. I mean, to be fair, I was I was nice when I was young. I, I guess I'm still nice, but it's not gonna work anymore for me. Even if I hang a lot of stockings by the door, um, I don't think I'm gonna get any gifts. So, <laughs> alrighty, but. Anyways, that's the end of our show today, guys. Hope you like it. Hope you learned something new. And uh, thank you for joining me today. Don't forget to leave your thoughts. <coughs> My voice cracked. Don't forget to leave your thoughts about the topics we discussed in the comment section below. And I'll see you uh, next time. I'll see you next time. I'll see you another uh, for another episode this week. So uh, I hope you guys stay happy, healthy, and awesome. I'll say bye for now. Bye.